would, yeah. <laughs> that would be horrible. <laughs> My planet needs me. so much better uh, sitting down that it's like I know. informal but yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> all eyes are up there anyway yeah. Yeah. yeah I know that's why I never understood why they like um, they record um, like the speaker instead of showing the slide I've seen that too so it's like you're just you're just trying to see the slide right for the material oh we got mics out there for questions is that what that's yeah. do we have to hit a record button did they say anything about it uh, you're being recorded for speaking to the mic. Please repeat questions. Oh, oh I'm sure he just said it. Okay. One minute. One minute. We'll wait. We'll give us 60 seconds to start. Dun dun dun. <laughs> That's a pretty good turnout. Assistant guy tell us it. Oh uh, yeah. To start or. Alright. Uh yeah. He'll tell us when to start. <laughs> it's one. It's ten forty-five. Okay. I'm always ready. <laughs> <laughs> Except for when I'm not. Yeah. Well, that's true. No, oh, yeah, that's fine. All right, guys, uh, we're going to get started. Um, yeah. Uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to stop us in the middle or you can wait to the end. Uh, we got a lot of stuff to cover, but we definitely want to leave time for you know any questions, any, any further explanations of the topics we're covering. It's a lot of stuff. But but uh, yeah, we can definitely make time for any questions. And if we can't get any questions, uh, just hit us up after the session. Cool. Hello. <laughs> Steve, want to go first? Yeah, sure. So I'm Steve Worley. I'm from Australia. Um, I work with Acquia as a technical consultant. I've been here for the past two years. Um, and my day to day is kind of like running around, uh, working out business requirements and mapping them to Drupal functionality and doing that kind of stuff. So it's quite challenging. It's quite interesting, quite rewarding. Um, I wanted to talk to you about a bit of a story about past projects that I've had that's kind of led me down the decoupled space. So at my previous job, I was working with a, a, a large um, travel company Then we managed around 80 different brands. And each brand had around 200,000 products that we were syncing between each site. So it was worked out to being around 16 million database records across all of our sites. And um, most of that was duplicated content. And that doesn't really make sense to me, so I started looking at a way that we could centralize that data and then expose it via APIs to all of those 80 sites. So that was kind of just a, a brief intro into how I kind of got into the decoupled space and started looking at ways that we could use APIs to syndicate content around rather than kind of duplicating it through databases. Great. Hey, everyone. My name is Jason. I am not from Australia. I'm from Atlanta, a little south of here. Um, I've actually been with Acquia for four years, and I'm the front-end lead in professional services. Uh, my experience with Decoupled Drupal started um, more intensely a year ago when I was tasked with helping lead several initiatives. So a lot of my day kind of 
stretches from multiple roles, but there's a lot of decoupled conversations, right? And we'll get into that as far as like, is my project or is the scope of my project appropriate for decoupled Drupal? I know there's you know a lot of things to, to cover with that topic, um, but pretty much you know my day to day as far as like working through best practices uh, with decoupled, how to communicate, um, uh, best use cases for communicating the scenarios as well. Um, so so yeah, kind of cover things all over the place. Cool. So uh, let's just jump into. Uh, about the presentation. I'll run through these pretty quick. Um, uh, I'll give you guys a quick quick refresher on decoupled Drupal. Obviously, since this is more advanced topics, we won't you know, belabor the point for these items too much, but we'll give you, a, I guess, a little bit of a flavor of uh, our opinions on it. Uh, yep, yeah, next we'll jump into uh, React plus Drupal, the, the new hot couple. Um, we want to kind of cover uh, React as uh, like our framework to kind of discover and utilize the APIs, but you know we've used a lot of things like Vue, Angular uh, across the board. We just chose React because we wanted to honestly play uh, play around with GraphQL and React um, in our decouple kit, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, next, we'll cover orchestrating Drupal API data. Um, we'll primarily use GraphQL as a way to communicate this, but there's uh, you know several other options out there as far as middleware, proxies, uh, ways to do this. Uh, we really want to communicate why we chose the path we did, um, which I'll get to in a second, as far as uh, understanding architectures and comparing architectures, right? So um, depending on your project and the scope of your project, various things are obviously required. So we wanted to kind of take a step back within our decouple kit, which we bought, um, just to explore each option and compare like, you know, why is the proxy helping in this scenario? Why are we not, you know, for example, interacting directly with the JSON API? Like, we really wanted to kind of dig into those scenarios just to understand them uh, so we can communicate those out to help other people um, get their learning jump started. Uh, next, we'll cover uh, decoupled development in the real world, right? Um, you know, for POC or talks, um, you, can, you can cover more high-level things, but, you know, we all live in the world of real projects, you know, real scope, real scalability, how to extend, um, and, and choosing architectures that are fair uh, to hand off to clients even after we're done. Um, that's, you know, a big passion of mine and Steve's as far as, like, choosing the right architecture for the client, not using the newest, coolest thing, throwing it over the fence and, you know, skedaddling out. Uh, and lastly, we'll give you guys a demo um, of our decoupled starter kit. Um, I, we probably didn't mention this before. This isn't anything we're selling. This is completely open source for you guys to download, play with, you know, use as well. Uh, we used a lot of different toolkits, uh, the, the React Slingshot, uh, Headless Lightning, GraphQL, as I mentioned before. So basically our only purpose was to uh, help for their own learning to help enable people on our team and people outside of Acquia. So it's essentially just like a developer, um, a developer's exploratory, you know, journey of understanding different architectures, discussing it, arguing about it, um, making the best decisions, you know, based on what we're trying to communicate, but also like understanding that there's a lot more things we can build and a lot more things that, you know, we'd love to hear from you guys as far as what you would find interesting. Cool, okay, so we'll run into uh, some quick things with the basics of decoupled Drupal. So obviously with decoupled Drupal, uh, the main theme is that you're using Drupal as a content store, right? So once again, this doesn't need to be you know, just Drupal. I think so, so many times as Drupalists, we focus so heavily on Drupal as like the main cog in the relationship of these different architectures. But in a lot of cases, it's just 10%, right? Like you're dealing with several APIs, legacy systems, old .NET architectures. So I think it's important to kind of like scope it that way as far as like, yes, this is an API first um, approach to Drupal, but you're also dealing, you know, many scenarios, which we'll cover in the decoupled kit, other API scenarios. Um, you know, obviously another big component of what we're talking about is shifting the responsibility of the presentation layer to non-Drupal applications. In this case, it's React, but it doesn't mean necessarily you're negating the front end altogether. Like we've explored a lot of scenarios, you know, with ourselves and clients as far as like, stubbing out certain content types to be used, you know, to, to run like native React Native apps, but it doesn't mean you're necessarily not using the front end. I know there's a bit of, you know, discussions about that as far as like why would you negate so many things in Drupal. We're, we're definitely not, you know, proposing that and, and we'll make that really clear throughout the presentation, but we also want to kind of talk to that too. 
Um, and once again, you know, just enabling external applications. Um, this could be several things. Um, it could also be using external APIs to bring data back into Drupal, which we'll kind of cover through Marvel's API in a second uh, with the kit. Um, but also like understanding what that means as far as like best practices using OAuth, you know, validation, um, how to set your tokens, a lot of that, that fun stuff. Um, like I mentioned before, um, a big focus that we wanted to do was understanding how to synthesize non-Drupal and Drupal data and what that means. Like, is it better to use, like if you're using, you know, for something more marketing for combining that data and you just want to, you know, essentially use like an external views mode, essentially to like pull in like marketing data or things like that, or are you really migrating information back? So we actually, um, we'll cover this in a second, but we actually cover the scenarios of dealing directly with JSON API or using the orchestration layer, um, like we'll talk about. Um, so just to re reiterate um, the first point, API first approach, uh, our version of API first uh, Drupal isn't about negating features. You know, Drupal spent years and years doing things really well, trying to do things even better. So we're, we're definitely in no way proposing, okay, build your own editorial workflow. Like, hey, let's, you know, custom workbench and React. Like, to us, that's crazy. Because we don't want to, like, take away things that Drupal is good at to build custom solutions for. Our, our theories are more to extend and allow Drupal to power, you know, with editors having a comfort level, allowing, uh, that comfort level for them to, you know, go through normal, you know, workflows as far as editorial experiences, but also power multiple uh, other, you know, mobile apps, Alexa, things like that. So we really want to focus that as far as like, you know, our, our, our big focus. Um, this is a big question uh, that we could probably spend three hours in here. I'm sure a lot of people have opinions, which is awesome. Um, we don't see headless as like a yes, no checkbox, right? We, we see, what we see is different qualifying patterns, which I'll kind of run through now, but uh, these definitely depend on the scope and, and very various scenarios, like, you know, the technical scope of your developers, who you're handing this off to, how is this gonna scale, and things like that. So I'll run through these real quick. Um, typically in my discussions, we start out with the client is in, I guess, phrasing it like this. Is your business focused on making API first, your priority, right? So it's not like, hey, do you guys wanna play with React or do you wanna play with GraphQL? It's more of a, is your business ready to work towards the directive of supporting and building on the API first? And the other things will kind of fall, fall in sync after that. Um, also, is there a functional need to interact with data outside of Drupal? That's a big one too. Um, you know, from what we've seen, if there's you know like a one-to-one -one relationship as far as having a React app that is is essentially like pulling nodes and displaying it, you know, it's not really that enticing. So, so we see you know, more like the synthesizing of you know different API endpoints and pulling different legacy data elements or more custom personas on, you know, like microsites, proxies, things like that, a little more enticing as far as the architectures that makes sense. Um, yeah, and a lot of this too kind of comes down to, not that it's necessarily a qualifier, but, you know, you talk to a lot of, a lot of technical folks that, you know, have their preference of working outside of Drupal or not being hindered by Drupal. Um, and, and that's perfectly fine. You know, you want to do what's right for your client first, regardless of who you work for or your role. So we try to really focus on what's the comfort level of the people that are taking this on and helping develop. Um, so if, you know, you have teams that are, you know, well-versed in React, Angular, you know, there's tons of awesome people out there and don't want to deal with Twig and a lot of that, we also want to, like, adhere to that. So even if it's a little bit more work as far as, like, validating and structuring content for an API, that's fine. You know, like, if, if they're willing to adopt as far as from a business perspective that directive, then we definitely want to enable people and, and have them, you know, work in the direction they're comfortable with. Cool. So I think it's important to understand what a content API is and how Drupal fits into the mix in providing that content API to many different clients. So traditionally, APIs have been a way for applications to share data between one another. Um, and the content API is no different to that. It's a way of sh sharing content from a source to many different clients. The where, it, where it differs from a traditional API is that content is much more different to typical uh, interactions with an API. So content has references, content has relationships, and content has all these complex metadata around it that we need to kind of replicate within an API. 
Um, so things like JSON API and um, HAL are standards around how the APIs can expose that data in a way that the application can already infer different references. Um, so when we talk about Drupal as a content API, uh, providing a content API, we need to really pull back a lot of what Drupal actually is good at. So controlling layout, adding classes, adding styles in, in line with WYSIWYGs and things like that, which is things that we allow content teams to do. We kind of need to pull that stuff right back and say, you can't actually do this anymore. Um, because that then loosely couples our front ends to our back end, which we don't want in, decoupled, in the decoupled space, right? We want to make sure that we just provide enough data and enough content for people to build good experiences with. Um, so content APIs like JSON API, like HAL and different specifications, um, they strive to maintain the relationships between content. So I, if you've used JSON API, you'll see that any reference is a link to that reference and then you, get, you have to make another HTTP request to pull that stuff back and then you have um, then you can have a full understanding, a holistic understanding of what that content is. Um, so this is also about kind of making sure that the content is available for multiple different types of clients as well, so not just websites. In the way that the landscape is evolving, we're kind of starting to see things like chatbots and you know, Alexa integrations and all these kinds of things that can start leveraging the content APIs. Um, and if you start putting presentation in your API, you'll start ruining the different interactions between different uh, different front ends for your apps. One last thing I think I want to touch on with um, content APIs and how Drupal can fit in here is that um, out of the box, the, the JSON API module will give you a lot of functionality with your different content types and do all that kind of stuff. But if you do have custom modules and custom functionality that you need to provide to your different front ends, you have the ability to extend those with REST plugins. So that's just defining different REST endpoints and understanding how they handle the data that you transfer between both applications. Um, our, our, in our decoupled kit, we didn't really want to go down that route, and we just kind of wanted to use the out-of-the-box experience with Drupal and try and build um, a content site based on that kind of out-of-the-box experience without touching too much on the REST plugins, but you know that stuff's available if you need to um, go down that route as well. Um, the next thing here is that, so, Security is a pretty big thing around APIs, and how do you make sure that your API is secure and you know who's talking between who? Um, a lot of the headless profiles come bundled with simple OAuth in Drupal, and OAuth is a, the de facto open standard for securing APIs. Um, and we'll kind of touch on, I'll go through exactly what OAuth is. So OAuth is token-based authentication. Your client will send a request to the back end with some, some API credentials that you define, right? So you'll create a client, you'll set up a, a secret ID, uh, an access to a public ID, and you'll, you will sign that request with the back end and it will give you a token. Every request from the front end then is using that token and that will then operate on behalf of the user that generated it. So the back end knows that they, if I request and I get an authenticated user token, then I'm an authenticated user and I can have access to different content and different um, endpoints from the API. And this is all stuff that's handled by Simple OAuth as well. So Simple OAuth also provides different grant types, and this comes into consideration when we're actually defining applications. So there are two main um, grant types that you'll probably look to use if you go down the OAuth, um, the OAuth road. So there'll be pass the password grant type, which is something that's typically used by applications. And this doesn't really require user input to like log into the OAuth source it'll be between the applications to sign the request and generate a, a token for every request that that application will make. Um, and this is typically ha what you would see on like a mobile application um, rather than having your user login and then you will get all of that content. The other one is the access code grant type and that is the one where you will click on a login button it will redirect you to the source and you'll log in. So if you've ever used you know, Facebook and social logins when you want to give scope to certain information that you have, you'll log in and then you'll access the grant type and you'll allow the, the, the client to have access to your data. Um, and this, this, all this stuff is provided by Simple OAuth and the decoupled kit has examples of how this interacts with, with Drupal and with the React front end as well. So there's, we've got a page that we'll go through when we get up to the demo part um, about how, and we'll show the workflow fully from end to end of how the OAuth signs the request and how we get to actually see the content. And we've actually set up a, a little bit of an example where content's restricted for certain user types. So you'll see how you can actually start to map that stuff with use, uh, by using these OAuth and the, the scope and the grant types. 
Uh, cool. Um, so we wanted to include some information as far as within the decouple kit, as far as how you're dealing directly with JSON API. Um, once again, uh, we're in no way, I'll probably say this twice more, um, in no way are we, you know, proposing that you, you know, replace the normal node CRUD operations um, in outside elements. Um, but we did want to offer, you know, basically examples of how we're requesting the tokens, the tokens setting the headers, and giving examples for each CRUD operation. Um, so we just wanted to offer that maybe as a way to uh, enable people to understand like the normal workflow, but also like essentially what the requirements are. So we tried to make them really simple, re really easy to understand, and we built out the, and we built out the kit in that regards too, right? Like we have things broken down by components for Drupal CRUD operations by themselves, namespaced accordingly, and try to isolate the scenarios in a very easy to understand scenario. Um, so if we're looking at here, this is, uh, oh, by the way, sorry, for each of the content, for each of the um, components, we have separate content types. So for CRUD operations, we have dogs. Uh, no, I didn't include cats. Um, for uh, for uh, the GraphQL, um, orchestration layer, we included uh, Marvel's API, a comic book sells API, and a couple lo local storage devices. And then for the single relationship, we included Pokemon, um, some base stats, and then we also have another user type for um, basically user accounts that will show you guys how we deal with like mock APIs and GraphQL and kind of cool stuff like this. So this is just a quick example of a post request. And uh, with, yeah, any of the entity references, um, or sorry, yeah, any, any of the entity references, you have to make two calls. You have to essentially build it to begin with, validate, and then retrieve the information back for the final post. Um, so that's what essentially the post is. Um, this is just a retrieval. Um, this shows a little bit more about the content headers. Um, I believe with, with the last release of JSON API, we had to add like one more, uh, I think it was content type. Um, to the headers, but other than that, uh, nothing really adjusted. You know, pretty straightforward as far as like making those de declarations in the header, retrieving the information back, and I'll show you guys how we have uh, all this information stored not only with within Re uh, React, but we also have it within Redux. I, I'm not sure how many you folks are uh, knowledgeable with Redux, but we'll kind of explain how Redux is used within React to maintain state and kind of track different scenarios. Uh, definitely has some cool tools we want to show you guys as well. So with, with update requests, um, it's pretty much the same as a create request. It just needs to change the method that we send the request with. So this actually requires that we configure Drupal um, in a specific way, right? So Drupal's configuration as of, I think, 8.2 allows us to set um, API and the rest settings in the settings YAML files. So you need to ensure that we have, we're allowing the correct headers to actually make these requests as well. So if you ever want to go down the CRUD, operations, they need to accept um, patch, put, delete, post, and it needs to actually be in your configuration, otherwise it will not work. <laughs> um, one other thing I think that it was, it's important to touch on with both update and delete um, is that the API doesn't do a confirmation. So if you were expecting it to, or like in the Drupal UI, you click delete and say, are you sure you want to delete this? It doesn't actually happen in the API, which is to be expected, but it's just something to be aware of. Um, it will just automatically delete your content. <laughs> no problems there. <Yeah. laughs> cool, so now we get into the fun stuff. So orchestrating Drupal API data. So this slide's called why use GraphQL, but I think it's better to say um, that GraphQL here is, is actually a content middleware, um, and GraphQL just fits everything that we needed to define for what a content middleware is. So. In a lot of our projects, we see that um, we have multiple sources for data. We have uh, lots of different requirements around business logic on how to display that data and how to actually present it back to the user. Um, and what a content middleware will allow us to do is to provide a central place for all of that information. So any business logic around how to display the content, it's all in, in one place. Um, it allows, and that, that then will scale out when we need to add multiple clients to to make those requests to the content, right? So if we're adding a chatbot, if we're adding an Alexa integration, we're adding a website and a mobile app, you don't want to have to reproduce all of that logic in each application to make sure that they understand how to read the data, how to make those multiple requests to JSON API to pull back all of those reference fields, do all that kind of stuff as well. So the content middleware uh, needs to be able to handle all of those use cases and provide a nice interface to, for all of our clients to interact with. 
Um, one other key importance here is that it actually even further decouples our front ends from Drupal in a way that our front ends don't even know what they're talking to to retrieve their data anymore. And Drupal is purely providing the, the data to our content middleware. So why did, why did we choose GraphQL to do this? So GraphQL, uh, I'll just go through a quick basics rundown of what GraphQL is in case you haven't um, read up on it. But GraphQL is a structured query language that allows the user to, to define data types. And it's done pretty straightforward in JavaScript, so you can go through. Um, there are a few different implementations in different languages as well, so, but they're all roughly the same. So you define your data types. Um, you define what fields they are, what um, types of values those fields will um, contain. So you know your, your standard ints, strings, floats, all that kind of thing. Um, and then what it, what it does on top of that is it allows you to request for specific fields. So whereas um, REST and those kinds of things will return you the entire resource, GraphQL will actually allow you to say, I only need to display the title. So you can just do a query request to the GraphQL server, say, I only want the title, and it will just send that back to you. And that's a really powerful thing when you're creating front-end clients. You can reduce the chattiness between your application and the, and the back-end. Um, and then when you start going down different types of integrations, while it's fine with the web, you can do those requests, it's all fine. But once you get into like mobile apps, you're running into you know, restricted network access and all those kinds of things, you kind of want to keep the payloads between applications to a minimal. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, it simplifies that whole request pattern as well. Um, another important thing to note with GraphQL is that it's not actually tied to a storage mechanism. So where REST and stuff is typically a way to expose the database and the schema of your tables, the GraphQL layer allows you to define exactly how you will pull that information from wherever it, wherever it exists. So you can define an API request to pull some information back. So it can go to another service. You can pull, you could have it set up directly to query Drupal's database if you wanted to. You could do it, have another MongoDB on the node server that can have some data that you want to expose. And so you can do all of these kind of different things and you just define resolvers on how to actually access that data. And it's, it's, it's really quite powerful for that. Um, and the last thing to note, sorry. No, okay. <laughs> the last thing to note is that um, while it's mostly around reading data and retrieving data from different sources, for it to actually stand up against other um, SQL languages, it needs to provide a way for you to update those data, that data as well. So we have examples in the, the couple kit of how you can actually send mutation requests through to the GraphQL server and how we can then understand those and operate with different APIs to update the backends on how to change the data set. Cool. So, like I said, we kind of broke, a, broke uh, each of these components out by their functional purpose, right? So, in the example that we built with the Pokemon, we're just dealing, I'm not sure if you guys can see the graphic at the bottom left, we're just dealing with the one-to-one -one relationship as far as having GraphQL in the middle. So, we'll get to uh, the next example in a second as far as, like, the multiple APIs. But in this scenario, we dealt with just constructing things in GraphQL so we could use that middleware layer to define the schema types. Um, so, essentially, mo most of the work was done in GraphQL. QL as far as declaring those schema types um, and then defining those queries to accommodate. Um, in this case, it's just a single request, but you know we'll show you guys how uh, the resolvers are addressed later on. Uh, and then finally, just requesting that JSON that API data from GraphQL. And you know, as Steve mentioned, it was is really efficient as far as like uh, nested things like uh, taxonomies, images, things like that, where you have to typically hit multiple endpoints you know, uh, accommodate logic, pagination, things like that, but within GraphQL it was, you know, way easier. Uh, so we essentially did most of the work within that um, and then kind of followed that route. And then finally, um, we'll get to the React app as well as far as making those, uh, those essentially those queries to call that information. Um, we're not really running any uh, update uh, operations, so it's pretty much just fetching those nodes, but we wanted to show like a really simple example uh, for you folks as far as like understanding how to do that before we get to a little more complicated scenarios. The, 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 the decoupled kit also has a way, like so as, per, as we were saying before, a lot of business requirements end up having us talk to multiple APIs. So a legacy API in, internally or an external API that provides additional content to help expose some of the data that we need. Um, so we set up a, there's an example there of like kind of how it looks architecturally. We've got um, a set of Marvel characters coming from Drupal, and we actually wanted to augment that data with um, comic book, which comics they appear in, and then another API provides the sales data around that as well. So 
where the GraphQL server can handle talking to Drupal to get the initial result set and then also extending that through to different APIs to resolve for fields. One, one interesting thing to note with GraphQL is that if you don't actually request those additional fields, so if we don't say we want the comics books, <laughs> comic books returned with our request, GraphQL doesn't even make those API requests to, to do it. So it's another kind of performance win on the content middleware layer where it's only going to fetch the data that we need, present that through to us on our front ends. Um, we've, this is the example that we use to set up a mutation so we can add additional heroes to our back ends. Um, we can go through, when we go through the demo, we, you'll see that we've got a drop down that kind of is also powered by GraphQL and another different type of data storage mechanism. Um, and it will send us through a list of, list of heroes that we can use to add to our source and then that will just automatically update based on GraphQL knowing that we've got this hero name, we can go through to the different APIs, we can pull in all of that data and it's all kind of automatic after the initial um, update. We also started to, um, as we were developing this, we kind of ran into a few issues with uh, performance on the middleware. So once you start to add all of these different API requests, it's probably not the same if you've got databases, they're much faster, but API requests end up being slow. And especially one of the APIs we were using is quite slow. So we're like, uh, how do we improve the performance of our middleware here? Um, and that's when we found a set of tools from Apollo that allow us to actually cache those requests in the middleware. So you, it augments the GraphQL schema definitions with some cache tag um, availability so we can start using a local in-memory cache for the GraphQL server so it doesn't actually have to make those requests again either. So we get another performance win from the middleware. It's already built the resource. It already knows what the data is, stored in memory until the next time it clears or until um, you manually perform a cache clear. Cool, okay. So next we'll just jump into a couple topics with, like I mentioned before, uh, we're not really calling these best practices. This is more just the reality of developing and things that we're encountering you know, as we're b building uh, the kit, but also things in conversations with clients. So obviously when dealing with an API, uh, there's several scenarios, right? Like Steve mentioned with, with caching, uh, we handled with Apollo, but we also wanted to understand what it meant for local development, understanding uh, dependencies on outside APIs, uh, but also really like, uh, you know, failover scenarios. Like what happens if your API is down? What if the wrong things are cached? What if, you know, uh, how are we gonna address, address uh, cache busting on non-static elements? Uh, so we really wanted to kind of understand those and include those in the kit, which we addressed uh, as far as those typical workflow scenarios. But, you know, as you can assume, most of the scenarios are typically with multiple things depending on the speed of transferring data between those things. So that's what we try to focus on a lot as far as like understanding the right level of caching, not over caching, cache busting, things like that. And also like securing and tracking authentication. Uh, obviously, as we mentioned before, it's a big focus, but we wanted to kind of segment that information out too, you know, so you guys can, you know, download and understand. Cool, so the big one is API failover, right? Um, it's something, you know, just like deploying on a Friday or slow latency, you know, like until it's an issue for you, it's not an issue, right? But we need to, we really wanted to address like normal scenarios, so we, I think I wanna step back just for a little bit as far as like the high level, right? So like when we're talking about normal development, you're dealing with like scoping and allowing for plenty of time for like functional and unit testing. It's the same way with like any type of decoupled structure, right? Like it's really about planning and understanding like stability patterns, you know, the circuit breaker design pattern. Uh, Steve mentioned to me yesterday the chaos monkey, which Netflix uses as far as like just trying to break down your system at different parts. So a lot of that is just having the right things segmented for failover or caching things appropriately and understanding thing, things on a timing function so that you are addressing, if things are down, you can essentially store the last best scenario with that data so the user's not seeing any downtime, but then also checking pe periodically depending on the scenario, um, just like normal circuit breaker uh, architectures. Um, we also wanted to simulate API connectivity um, with local tasks. Uh, I'll get to that in a second, but we, you know, we rely heavily on mock uh, APIs. GraphQL offers you know, something out of the box with Apollo, um, but w there's a lot of things that you can include with React, not only with just test and you know, other, other functional testing suites. Um, yeah, uh, so let me jump into caching mechanisms, which we, um, once again, all these examples we'll get to in a second, but we you know, segmented these out as far as each scenario example. 
So this is just a way that we can use the client side caching mechanisms as well. So this is just adding more robust failovers for our whole decoupled application. So you've got proxy caching on Drupal, you've got Varnish and CDNs and all that stuff, kind of stuff to make sure the JSON API responds well. You've got the in-memory cache in GraphQL because all, all requests there are post requests. So you know setting up reverse proxy caching is a little bit more complicated. And then we also have the client side to deal with. And the client side has a few different caching mechanisms that we can employ. Um, so we've got them here and we've got examples of them in the decoupled kit as well. Um, but I'll quickly go through uh, what they are. So window.caches is a new API that the browsers are providing for us. Um, and it actually is designed around caching HTTP requests. So it will respect HTTP headers and it will also create different caches based on the very header that's sent back from the, uh, the API or the HTTP place that you're making the request to. Um, the local storage method is using window.local storage and it is kind of a simple key value store in the, brow in the client's browser. So it, it is, I think it's limited to 10 megabytes of data. So it's usually for really simple kind of content structures that you go, oh, the app can't not have this stuff. So we kind of need to put it somewhere in case it doesn't ever make that request again. Um, this is the simplest method to implement of all three. Um, but it does have a limitation on the size and it's much more restrictive than the other two. And finally, we have IndexedDB, which is an in-browser in relational database um, that is limited to 50 megabytes per browser. And some browsers have slight variations, but on average is 50 meg. Um, and then you, you have a full API around creating a local database for each browser that <coughs> makes a request to your application. Um, this is quite complicated and it doesn't use promises which most uh, new applications that you're developing in JavaScript will want to leverage, right? So you, you want to go down the promises route because it makes controlling the flow of the application much better, much easier. Um, so in the decoupled kit, we actually found a library that will help add promises around the browser's API for window uh, index DB, sorry, and it's called Dexy. So if you ever download the kit, you can have a look at Dexy and see the API that it's got, which is quite, quite useful and quite easy to use as well. Cool. So I'll touch on this real quick. Um, you know, I know mock APIs are synonymous with sexy development, but I'll run through these pretty quick. Um, why use mock APIs? I'll let you guys read through the list. But essentially, we're trying to emulate things on a local dev development um, level, but also working with other teams and external APIs can be a bit taxing as far as like rate limits and things like that. So we wanted to kind of address a way to simulate data as we're testing, but also like say you're, you know, you're creating a Jira ticket and you want to scope out what does it mean if we change the API construct in this way. Well, mock APIs are great too because we can actually, you know, if you're working with another team and we're understanding what needs to be requested, we can actually mock that up with a proper schema and the right tools and offer up that data to essentially demo and say, okay, would this work, you know, and especially when you're dealing with like external teams or external uh, dependencies, you don't want to be, you know, throttled by whatever's going on with the other, you know, scope or the other development team. So we definitely want to address that too. Um, and once again, you know, like testing uh, coverage is obviously big, not only with continuous integration, but local development. So we want to like really focus on like, you know, for the proper times, understanding running through like mocks, you know, retrieving basic data and not getting too complicated with it, but at least address, addressing the main like breakpoints as far as like hitting the right things uh, with the circuit breaker scenarios, just so we're understanding things. Uh, here's a couple methods that we took a look at. We're, we're using GraphQL as far as the Apollo uh, uh, tools uh, package. So we're using that as far as like emulating uh, the user information, but there's a lot of different options, right? Like with React, with React Adjust, you can test things. Node comes with JSON schema faker, you, and also Node, you can just use JSON server to use like a JSON file, and it'll build from that schema construct and serve up that data for you for local testing. Cool. All right, so now that we've talked about the coupled kit for 35 minutes, we're yeah. now ready to show you guys. Um, Steve, did you wanna cover the GraphQL stuff real first? Yeah, we can quickly go through this. So this is, okay. um, if you run your GraphQL server in dev mode, they give you a schema browser called Graphical. I think that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this kind of lets you just kind of really quickly qu query the, the schema types that you set up. So you can go through and you can show exactly what fields you want, what fields are defined and how the the server should respond to those things as well. So if we step through this, we can kind of see that um, 
we won't go through the code, but I understand, like I know that here that ref types is an actual, um, another reference field in the Drupal JSON API. So this is just kind of showing us that we pull it all back in one, in one request. We make a query with all of these inf fields and we need them all to display our, to build our front end API, our front end UI, and it will automatically make that request to Drupal again to pull the ref types back. It'll make that request again to pull the ability types back. and It'll, it'll do that all on the GraphQL server. And this kind of just explains how that works. Cool, yeah, and with the kit, we also uh, included a bunch of documentation, not only within the code itself, but also we built up a lot of readme files and read the docs. If you guys ever use it, it's pretty rad. Um, so we tried to step through the code as far as like, what are we trying to do? This function does this, this function is expecting this, we're expecting you know, this object here, um, just to you know, essentially communicate and help, help uh, everyone understand our typical workflow and, and our thinking as, you know, as far as the time we were building it. Yeah, and the code has pretty good documentation as well, so if you pull it down, you'll all, if we've ran into something that we had issues with, we kind of documented out our approach and why we chose a certain way to solve that problem yeah. as well. Yeah, minus the curse words. So. <laughs> So uh, if we look at the first example, as I mentioned before, we have things kind of broken out as far as each scenario. This is uh, essentially not using uh, GraphQL at all. It's just dealing directly with those uh, JSON API calls. So we have like an example for each of our dogs as far as like creating a new node, uh, looking at retrieving a list of nodes with each dog, and then using React to essentially like build, build in, have an editor there, upload a new image, and also removing the node. Um, so we, we broke these out like in a very simplistic way, but you can definitely get way more advanced with a lot of these things. We just wanted to, at least for the baseline, um, communicate that pretty easily and then get a little more jazzy on you know the feature branches. Yeah, and it shows you how the interactions work with Redux as well. Oh, yeah. So it will go through the action flow from Redux and it will go through triggering an event with Redux and sending that through and then sending that back to the, app, the front end so it updates and manages the state that way. Yeah. And here's uh, the Redux toolkit. Um, it's the window's kind of small, but it's kind of neat because you can actually bring things through as far as like the state timeline and actually emulate, you know, like the typical workflow of like retrieving the data, interacting with the data, and you can actually step and debug back through the code as far as how that is updated within Redux. So as I mentioned before, this is the one-to-one -one relationship with the Pokemon uh, data, and so we we uh, essentially have like the query here um, with it, exactly what we're using in GraphQL as far as fetching that information from GraphQL on that proxy layer. And then each of these is just like a node example as far as expanding it down, showing the different attributes, things like that. Not, not all the attributes, but just a couple. There's a lot. Um, so at the bottom, we also have like a quick example as far as like uh, we wanted to, you know, a lot of us are, you know, started out or mainly Drupal developers. We wanted to show like some some pretty simple cases, but clearly communicated cases as far as like React, how we're doing like data comparisons and things like that. So we have just, you know, like a real simple game as far as like matching one to one, like who would be the winner based on attribute. Um, but we definitely have some stuff upcoming that's a little more, you know, verbose as far as like uh, visually. Cool. So, Steve, did you want Yeah, to so this is the uh, example where we're s synthesizing data from multiple APIs, um, and we've got little badges on, um, on each row where the, the data comes from. So, uh, it makes a request to GraphQL, and it says that I want the comics and the comic sales, and that will then fetch those requests as well. And we've also got here, this is adding another, this is a mutation. So this is an example of sending a mutation query to the GraphQL server, it setting it up, doing that, inserting that node into Drupal, and then we have access to all this other data because those services know already that Black Panther is a, is a Marvel character and the APIs know how to pull that back. So really quickly, we get all of this extra information without ever having to migrate more of that content back into Drupal. We've got the middleware there pulling information in from other things based on how we know the uh, APIs work. Cool. Yeah. And just to be clear, like a lot of the work too with it, as far as like synthesizing the data it was mainly declared in GraphQL, right? Like so yeah. most of the work, we're looking at different services. There's a lot of obviously different services you could use, but we only want to use things like Marble that had large data sets. But you can do a lot of really cool things as far as like having like eight to ten different uh, APIs that you're essentially blending together and constructing in a way in GraphQL that's like really, really easy compared to just dealing directly with hitting those endpoints, you know, one off. Yeah. And if you also download this, the decoupled starter kit, this is the page that is leveraging the Apollo cache as well. So you'll see that the first load on this page will be pretty slow because that's a lot of data that's pulling back from, 
few APIs. Um, but every re request after that will be pretty quick. Yeah, I, I, before we used Apollo, I think we were at like 40 seconds. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Yeah, it was uh, there's a couple of tears in our eyes. But after using you know, the right configuration layer for the caching, um, definitely got a lot better. So this is our example on the different caching mechanisms in the, in the client though. So this is the browser's cache here. Um, Window.caches, we've got a little bit of a um, write up on how they work. So Windows.caches requires a service worker, which is also a new, a new concept in JavaScript land. So that basically um, the browser, your website will deliver another JavaScript file that the browser will run outside of your page. And it will set up a few different environment, uh, environment variables for that browser tab. And what it does here is it actually creates the cache for, our, for us to use window.caches. Um, after that, we've got the, the local storage one, um, and that's just simple key value pair that stringifies the response from the API. And the last one is actually using a local database. You can actually, um, if you open the developer tools, you can see how much data each one is using as well, and Chrome has some pretty good developer tools around this stuff. I believe it's in memory. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, I'll find it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, with the API document uh, data mock, um, as I mentioned before, we're using GraphQL, but I've used um, you know other JSON services as far as far as mocking this up. We have uh, a, most of our variables just included in, in a local .env file, which uh, you can obviously use for like hosting deployments to contextually switch between different APIs. But for our local storage. Um, we're just using a couple different variables, not a lot, a um, couple key pair values from Apollo. And for this one, we set, you know, mock to true, it's just a true false. And then based on that, it'll actually build whether we want to use like real data from GraphQL or GraphQL to generate the mock data. So that's essentially this example, and, and it's kind of broken out that way. Um, we jumped into a chatbot integration too with the Pokemon data. Um, just for fun, really. Yeah, so this one, <laughs> this one shows another client that's talking to the GraphQL server to pull information back. So. You can see there that it made a request and it, uh, it knows, it asked for the field speed into the GraphQL server and it pulled that value back. And we can start interacting with our client, uh, with our content in different ways. This is the uh, example that we've recently set up and it kind of shows the workflow of an OAuth request, making sure that we're gonna generate a token for a particular user. Um, so if we log in, it'll actually redirect us to the Drupal site. Um, we're already logged in here. So it'll ask us to grant the permissions, we grant them back and it sends it back, the token, and then we create, we, it sends back an access code which we then use to generate an OAuth token which can then be used to request information from the, the, the API on behalf of that user. So we see here that um, the Drupal roles has two. It has premium and authenticated. So one thing I didn't touch on when we were talking about OAuth is that simple OAuth uses Drupal roles to control scope. So um, in this case, we asked for the premium scope to be added to the, to the user's token when it generated it. Um, and what the simple OAuth module will do will actually do an intersection between the roles that the user has and the roles that you're requesting. So in this case, if we log in with the standard user, so we've got two users here, standard user doesn't have the premium role there. Even if we do request the premium scope, Simple OAuth won't generate that token with that scope. So this content here would not be visible to the standard user. Cool. And uh, go back. And that's it. Uh, we, um, let me check time real quick. Okay, cool, yeah. I wanted to allow, definitely allow enough time for questions um, if you guys wanna kinda jump into it. Um, the decouple kit is here for download. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions, please hit us up afterwards. We can talk over Steve for beer and a Zima for me, because I'm a gentleman. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, let us know if you have any questions. Um, just hit us up too on uh, Twitter or you don't use Twitter. Yeah, but hit him up yeah. on Twitter, not me. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, anytime after the conference at the booth, you know. Um, we, we, we will have a demo again in the booth tomorrow. Um, 
I think it's at 12 o'clock. So if you have any questions that we can't answer here, come up and have a chat and we can go through it. Yeah, time. and when everyone's um, downloading and trying out the different features, we'd love to hear feedback. We're definitely gonna make this an iterative process as far as like adding new features, exploring different architectures, which once again is just to help enable other people, provide feedback, contributions, things like that. We'd you know, be super happy as far as like if you guys had any information you wanna transmit back to us that we could help include in our roadmap. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, is there any reason to choose React as opposed to Angular or something like that as far as Drupal is concerned or, you know, for any reason whatsoever? Uh, not really. It was just a personal preference. We wanted to use GraphQL, so we thought it, you know. Yeah. We Facebook wanted... writes both. So yeah. Just... <laughs> and Facebook's so trustworthy, we decided to go with React. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, but no, yeah, no, it was just uh, essentially just a preference. I have worked with Angular in the past before, so we wanted to essentially try React to understand like Redux, especially with the binding of the data within the API, so that was the main reason. Yeah, and hopefully I can actually, we can get in and write a framework similar to the React one with the other front ends as well. So yeah. we can use Vue and Angular, and there'll be a different starter kit kind of thing for each different JS framework. Yeah, precisely. Yes, um, yeah, so, with JSON API, you're passing structured data, but it doesn't directly address handling serving up files, like CMS managed files, including images and PDFs. Do you have a philosophy or suggestion about how you would do that? And do you proxy it, or like in our case for Edutopia, we wound up spinning it out as a separate service? Yeah, um, up to this point, probably our opinion would be the same. Just because uh, what we discovered was not only with like the complications of doing like the round trips, um, just the caching was an issue, dealing with like a CDN, because you're essentially sidestepping what you could do in Drupal and serve those assets or address it as a separate CDN. Um, we tried a couple different scenarios. I think currently we're just using like file entities, but we, we uh, I think next like number one priority on our list is look at different ways to address that. So we'll probably have examples as far as like serving it up even from like a third party CDN or something like that just to make it easier. But that is, yeah, definitely one of the big, you know, bumps. Yes, sir. Uh, you probably have total control of the data coming from Drupal. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, uh, could you have used uh, the GraphQL server to grab data straight from Drupal instead of going to uh, the JSON API? You could. Um, you'd need to expose the database um, to a remote requests, but you can do that as well. So there are node ha there are node packages. In this case, in our example, we're just using a Node.js server for the GraphQL server. There are node packages to integrate with a MySQL database. So you could have that queried directly to the MySQL database to pull those fields back and that information back as well. You don't need to go to JSON API. Okay, and it's but but it's not part of the kit right now. Not right now. Okay. No. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah. Thanks, Unless everyone. Could, yeah. Thank you.